So this video lecture is going to talk about the two pieces that we're reading this week um, about the British Caribbean, specifically Trinidad. Um, so that would be James Anthony Froud's The English in the West Indies and John Jacob Thomas's Social Revolution. Um, so I'll tell you first off, um, the Caribbean is not a culture I know a tremendous amount about. I find it very interesting, but it's not, um, it's not a culture and a literary heritage um, that I have much. Sorry, that I have much background and experience in. Um, but one thing I do know that's sort of important in the way that we understand the British West Indies, which would be sort of the Caribbean and a sort of small part of, of South America, um, one thing that's really important about this set of colonies, as opposed to almost all of Britain's other colonies, is that Caribbean possessions changed hands continuously throughout the 17th and 18th centuries into the 19th century. So, you take an island like Trinidad, it was first, uh, it was first owned by uh, the Caribs and the Arawaks, who were the indigenous peoples. They were wiped out by the Spanish, who took control of the island. Um, and then it was owned sort of in succession by the French, uh, by the British, French, Dutch, an odd sort of Polish-Lithuanian uh, principality that apparently had colonies in the Caribbean, which I had never even heard of until I was doing some background research on, on Trinidad. Um, and then it came into the British, it came into British hands um, in the late uh, late 18th century, and it remained in British hands uh, throughout the Victorian period. So, the reason this is important is because we have this sort of blending of cultures, we have a vast sort of array of cultural influences, much more so than we have in most of the other uh, colonial spaces. Like, you take Nigeria, for instance, this is, really, this is just a British colony, and it is for most of its existence. Um, South Africa, you have the Boers, who were Dutch colonists, but then the British take over, and the British control it for most of its heritage. So we have a few places where we have sort of multiple European influences, but nowhere as much as the Caribbean. We've got English, we've got French, we've got Spanish, we've got Dutch, we've got, um, and then we've got, obviously, tons and tons and tons and tons of Africans who are being brought over as slaves, largely to work in sugar plantations. Um, so we've got this blending of cultures uh, that produces some of the sort of fascinating, vibrant cultures of the modern Caribbean. Fraud is... Fraud is a complicated figure in this. Uh, he is sort of a sociologist uh, who's interested in the West Indies, and his project ultimately, it seems, is to promote the British Empire and to make it clear that the British Empire stands for security, stability, safety, uh, protection, ease, comfort, all of this stuff. Um, so he's talking about Afro-Caribbeans in Trinidad under the British Empire, uh, and he's talking about he's he, he's talking about how good life is for them. So this is 1650. He says, "The earth does not contain any peasantry so well off, so well cared for, so happy, so sleek and contented as the sons and daughters of the emancipated slaves of the in, of the English West Indian islands." Sugar may fail the planter, but cocoa, which each peasant can grow with small effort to, for himself, does not fail and will not. He may better his condition, if he has any such ambition, without stirring beyond his own ground, and so far perhaps his ambition may extend if it is not turned off upon politics. Even the necessary evils of the tropics are not many or serious. His skin is proof against mosquitoes. There are snakes in Trinidad, dead as there were snakes in Eden. Plenty snakes, said one of those 
one of them who was at work in his garden. Plenty snakes, but no bitey. As to costume, he would prefer the costume of innocence if he were allowed. Clothes in such a climate are superfluous for warmth, and to the mind of the Negroes, unconscious as they are of shame, superfluous for decency. So he's painting what he thinks is this very idyllic island paradise kind of picture. Uh, and it does sound nice. I mean, it, I'm not a big fan of the heat, but it sounds like a, a nice place to live. Uh, and no real pressure to do anything. There's no... And I, I mean, again, you have to keep in mind that one of the contrasts here, one of the implicit comparisons for Froude is industrial Britain. Uh, so this would be a space sort of of poverty, of, of dirt and disease, uh, where sort of life is ruled by the clock. Life is very mechanical. You get up and you go to work for your shift, you stay for a certain a measured amount of time and all this. And he's saying, eh, it's Trinidad. They just sort of lie around and, uh, I don't know, drink, drink coconut milk and rum and whatever it is. And this is what they do. It's it's great. It's perfect. And he says, the reason that this can happen, the reason that this idyllic island paradise can exist, is because of what he calls the beneficent despotism of the English government, which knows no difference of color and permits no oppression. So the idea here is that it's only because the British rule Trinidad that... Uh, the residents of the island can have this idyllic paradise with no uh, with no pressure to sort of work or or do anything. Um, and he, he makes this very odd he makes this very odd apology for slavery, which I think is unsettling. It should it should probably be un, unsettling uh, to us today. He says uh, bottom of 1651, when we consider what the lot of common humanity has been and is, we shall be dishonest if we deny that the balance has been more than redressed. And the Negroes who were taken out of Africa as compared with those who were left at home, whereas the elect of salvation, who after a brief purgatory are secured in eternal blessedness. So the idea here is that slavery was not only okay, it was actually a good thing, because Yes, their ancestors worked as slaves for a while, and this is their immediate ancestors, like their parents and grandparents and so on, worked as slaves for a while, but then they get to live in Trinidad, and it's awesome, and they only have to sort of sit around and poke a stick in the ground, and cocoa grows, and they can sell it, and everything is awesome, and they have coconuts, and snakes that don't bite them, and, and all this stuff. And it's this really sort of weird... really weird idea, this sort of notion that slavery was actually good for the people who were enslaved, because then they get a nice place to live. Um, and he says here, he's talking, this is 1652, he's talking about the need for continuing English government, the maintenance of the authority of the English crown. Um, and he's talking about this, and he says, if, for the sake of theory or to shirk responsibility, we force them to govern themselves, the state of Haiti stands as a ghastly example of the condition into which they will inevitably fall. So the idea here, fraud is coming down 100% against colonial independence, against uh, self-rule for Trinidad and things like this. And the reason that he does this is because he takes the model of Haiti, which was a French colony... Uh, a French slave colony producing sugar until 1804 uh, when it gained it, its independence and became the second republic after the United States to overthrow a colonial power. Um, but Haiti has basically, since the revolution in 1804, been a sort of symbol of economic depression. It's got a weak economy, it's got a weak infrastructure, uh, economic depression, and so on, and so on. And so, Froude is concerned that if the British give up control of Trinidad, what would happen is that um, 
the island paradise he finds will descend into this sort of economic and political chaos of, of a place like Haiti. We get here, though, John Jacob Thomas, who directly responds to Froude. Like his, his book here, Thomas's book here, is a specific, direct, and purposeful response to uh, the claims that Froude makes. And he quotes from Froude extensively in this excerpt that we have. I mean, top of page 1653, virtually the first third of that page is quoting directly from Froude. And then what Thomas does that's really sophisticated and clever is he takes the claims that Froude is making and from an Afro-Caribbean standpoint, because Thomas is uh, from Trinidad and he is the... Uh, He's the children of, of slaves who were brought to Trinidad by the British. Um, from this perspective, he interrogates Froude's claims, and he says, mm -hmm. here's how things look from an Afro-Caribbean perspective, as opposed to from a white British perspective. Um, and one of his big critiques of Froude, because he, he brings up this claim that Froude makes, that... Afro-Caribbeans should be grateful to the British for emancipation from slavery. And Thomas says, this is 1653, What are we Negroes of the present day to be grateful for to the us, personified by Mr. Froude in the colonial office exportations? What he's saying here, what he means here, is that Froude's claim that Afro-Caribbeans should be grateful doesn't stand up because the end of slavery did not mean the end of colonial exploitation. And in fact, what what happens, what continues to happen in the Caribbean, in these in these British colonies, is that they continue to be resource colonies, which means they continue to produce sugarcane, cocoa, uh, and these other sort of spices that the British want. These other uh, these other crops that the British want. And that labor continues to be done by Afro-Caribbeans. Uh, so the idea here is that freedom had not, has not meant for uh, people in Trinidad, for people in, in the Caribbean, that they're elevated to the status of the British. It means that they are uh, that they are kept more or less in the same condition as colonial subjects that they had been before. And, and, and Thomas ends his section, this section here, with this appeal to these sort of great British moral traditions, this idea of fair play, which is really central to how the British see themselves. Um, the British believe very deeply in the value of fair play, which, um, I mean, I guess we could define as, as sort of giving everyone a sporting chance. Um, and so Thomas sort of appeals to this. Uh, Thomas appeals to this sort of British sense of this is fair, this is just, this is the way that things should be done. And he claims that right for Afro-Caribbeans.